Hey, what's up everyone and welcome to The Well, your source for the latest in the field of after school and summer learning programs. Today we're here with Carlos Santini with the All-Stars. Hey, what's up, Carlos? Hello, Mr. Marquesi. How you doing, brother? Good, man. We go <laughs> way back. I was counting sure the years do. and now we go way back. Yeah, you know, it's crazy because I've heard you give that intro, I don't know how many times. And the fact that I'm on the other end of that intro now is like, whoa, I feel like I'm a... A little bit of a celebrity here, man. Like, I, I got that. Like, wow. Wow, cool. I, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, this channel's taking off, and thanks yeah. to all the subscribers out there. But this channel is specifically for our site coordinators and program managers out there that just need to hear from the experts out in the field about what does their everyday life look like. So hmm. from the All-Stars perspective, can you tell us a little bit about the role that you play with the All-Stars? And, sure. and what, what, what do you do? Um, what do I do with basis. my time? Like, <laughs> what do they pay me to do? Right. Um, so, so first of all, yeah, I'm, I'm with the After School All Stars National Office. I've been here a um, little over two and a half years after spending 13 years with the, the LA chapter of the After School All Stars. So mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to be part of the founding team that started the project in LA back yeah. in 2002. Uh, so now I serve as the VP of programs for our national work, uh, working with 19 cities across the country, mostly urban areas, or I would say 100% urban areas, um, working alongside, I would say around 4,000 staff across the country, 70,000 youth um, in about 400 school sites. So my work is primarily around four things. It's about establishing great partnerships that continue to add value to our work and bring added benefit to our schools and communities uh, to help develop professional development and curricul curriculum plans for our chapters and our chapter leaders. Um, and what I mean by chapters, I mean cities. Right. So they can continue to improve the quality of their work. Uh, work alongside a development team to identify funding strategies and what the field needs because uh -huh. uh, oftentimes in national organizations uh, funding can sometimes be misaligned so it's always important to say all right we're raising money for the right things and for what's actually needed yeah uh, and then and then finally I think just setting all setting overall strategy and vision for what we want our programs to accomplish yeah so Carlos the question that I get all the time from our site coordinators and our staff out at the site level is they tell me can you make this a career? Can you yeah. make after school and summer mm. learning a career? What What is your story like? Well, how did you get into after school? I mean, wow. from that band of brothers out yeah. at the site level who we all yeah. know and love so well to where you sit today with all that yeah. brainstorming behind you. Um, yeah. Oh, you see, that, you see that back there. That, right? That's good stuff. That's always good stuff. You're telling yeah, it's all the secrets. Yeah, always good stuff. You know, this, this is your... Uh, for all you, all you site folks, this is these are your best friends, right? Little Sharpies right here. You got to... Have those handy, um, yeah. but uh, it's interesting. I, I think, uh, and I'll pre and I'll preface it by saying that if your love is in youth development and if your love is in wanting to make an impact, regardless of where your career starts, at least sharing my experience, you end up there somehow. Uh, so for me, my actual professional career began in marketing and public relations, which is kind of interesting. Mm. Um, so I've always had a real interest in, uh, in being able to, to pitch ideas, pitch concepts, brainstorm uh, campaigns. Uh, so that's kind of been a fun thing. Yeah. But, but during my college years, my youth, that's where I really started finding my love for youth development. I, I worked for what we call UCLA official student um, uh, associated, the official charity of the Associated Student Body at UCLA. Uh, it, it goes by the name of UCLA Unicamp. Mm -hmm. And Unicamp's mission is to send a cohort of youth uh, for, sev for a con con continuous seven weeks of various cohorts of middle school youth up, to the up in the mountains with UCLA students. Right. A seven-day camping experience so that, A, yes, kids get outdoors and they experience nature, but also they spend a week with a college student to demystify what a, who a college student is and where they come from. Right. right. So it was cool to be with them for two years doing that work, being out there, being a camp counselor. That's where, I, that's where my love for youth development originally began. So once that took place and then I started going through life and going through my various career options, um, one day a, a colleague of mine who knew a pretty high-ranking Board member within the All Stars then was looking for good people, 
And my friend said, hey, they're starting a nonprofit in LA. They're looking for a startup team. They told me in about maybe a 30 second pitch what it was. And before it was over, I said, I'm in. I'm yeah. In. Yeah. I'm in. Uh, and I came in as an administrative assistant, uh, being, a, being an admin for the executive director then. And that was in 2002. And because of the fact that I, I really had a, a love for this work, I was able to move up through, through, through the ranks and take on more responsibility. So it's been, it's been a fun ride. Yeah, that's the story of a lot of us, right? Moving yeah. up the ranks, and now yeah. it's now a, a second generation, a second wave of people are going through the ranks and taking on leadership roles, which yeah. I really love. And I think that one of the things that we always have to tell our folks out in the field is, can you visualize what the next level looks like? And a lot mm. of us cannot. Uh, yeah. And so I always tell the funny story of how we got together as brothers at the Boost yeah. Conference to mm -hmm. talk about my brother's keeper before it was my brother's keeper. Yeah, And that right. inside joke was that we b basically had two bags of Doritos chips <laughs> sat around the table and we said, what are we going to do yeah. for our babies out there? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And what yeah. a lot of people don't know, Carlos, is that you were the one that took the initial draft, wrote the initial draft for what became the mm. initial grant in California to launch the My Brother's mm -hmm. Keeper initiative. Remember that? Yeah, yeah I remember that, bro. Wow, and, good memory, man. Good memory. <laughs> yeah, and it's definitely, we have to give shout out to the people yeah. who do the great work behind the yeah. scenes, right? So yeah. in those last few years, what has been your experience with these conversations that we have behind the scenes, such like the MBK yeah. um, conversation? What is your experience behind the scenes? Yeah, so it's interesting because I, I think the experience is that I guess I could I could qualify it by saying that MBK is everywhere, right? MBK is is almost like this operating system that is working beneath an uh -huh. interface. So no matter what you offer, uh, sports based work, leadership, nutrition, tech, STEM, that there are MBK themes. So in this experience of these conversations. We've been grappling with the idea of MBK is a way of being. It's it's an ideology. It's not a thing. It's not tangible. It's not something that's in a box or that you can point at it and say, yeah, that's MBK one through five. Right. Uh, it is it is an it is an idea. It is a spirit. It is a, it's a conviction. And so that's been both the blessing and the challenge uh -huh. is that it's open source. You can build it in anywhere. But our net, our work, our field is so used. It's it, oftentimes we can operate on something that's packaged and ready to go. A, B, C, one, two, three. Right. Um, that it, it's um, it presents a challenge and and an opportunity for people to say, "Wow, uh, you know, if we're looking at issues of character, if we're looking at issues of narrative, if we're looking at issues of leadership, of that decision making, transitions, going from middle to high, high school to college, uh -huh. that you can you can build in." Um, MBK themes throughout any of those things. Yeah. So that's kind of been my experience these last couple of years. And, and I think that the perception out there in the general field, at least, and you do a lot of national work, is that yeah. there's this perception that someone owns MBK, mm. right? Yeah. Where the reality is that MBK is happening across programs and places every day, and a lot of yeah. people aren't using the moniker, but they're doing MBK work. And so yeah. if they're expecting for somebody to package what MBK should look like and give it yeah. to somebody, I think the missed opportunity is that you should already be doing it every day, right? Yeah. And then our job is essentially to connect the dots of all the great work that's happening out there and be able to share it to a larger audience. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I completely agree. Uh, I mean, I'll give a tangible example out of Oakland because I think Oakland is a hotbed and a mm -hmm. real focal point of, of social justice themes that again are found through the MBK or, or embodied in the MBK. Yeah. Uh, when we started our project there in this past summer, we collaborated with Claremont Middle, which is a campus right there in Oakland, to develop an advisory. So we actually ran a core day class uh, with themes of social justice, uh, themes of character development, leadership, decision making, uh, for what I would consider a, a challenged population of youth. Mm -hmm. that needed additional resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, you look at that effort and you go, wow, okay, a core day class, an advisory um, uh, that is really meant to meeting the needs of us.
special population of youth. Uh, in there, you've got MBK interlaced yeah. into, into all that. So I think that's just an, an example of what you just shared. Yeah. And so, Carlos, you know, in our group, we, we have all different personalities, right? From yeah. Diego to Rodrigo to mm-hmm. Regino to everyone else in the group, right? Yeah, Everybody yeah. brings their something to the table. Mm. So you are highly considered around this field as the thinker, the forward thinker mm. of our time okay. in the expanded learning field. Um, so the simple question, which is a difficult, uh, it could be difficult in that, how do how do you serve as my brother's keeper? Hmm. Wow. Uh, well, first, I think you have to you have to embody your own experience and your background, meaning that I've got my own insecurities. I've got my own challenges that I run up against in my work as a thought leader, um, a, a leader within my organization. And uh, so I think in many ways, the, the way I embody MBK is that I own my story. Mm-hmm. Right? I own my story. I know my background. And I have to share it with people that there are times when you own your background and you use it as inspiration. Yeah. And there are times when your own background holds you back and it's almost like an impediment. It's a bit of an obstacle for you. And so my job is to voice that and to really share with our leaders, you need to break through that. And Diego and those guys, they've been around. Diego has seen me kind of go through those ups and downs of, of wrestling with my own identity as a, as a, as a, um, um, as a leader, uh, as, a, as a, I would say, a young man of color, right? Uh, young man, if you consider mid-40s young, I think, I think you can still. I think um, you can. I think you can. So I, I think you have to own your story and understand that there's times when it works against you and you've got to be aware and there is times that it gives you inspiration and it inspires others. Yeah. That's how, that's how I've embodied, I think, MBK personally. And Carlos, what is the personal or professional responsibility that you have in owning that story into now a role of decision-making power where I would argue there's a difference between power of influence and power mm. of decision-making? It's really scary when you actually own yeah. both. Yes. So how do you embrace that? And what do you tell the, the next wave of leaders that there's a lot of folks out there that have power of influence in those communities? Yeah, I, I would say when you look at the idea of influence, don't doubt your ideas. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a man of color in this, in, in this field, in education or in any field in general, oftentimes we can step back from our ideas. Yeah. Um, I think there's times there's cultural norms that we've accepted that keep us from being bold yes. and saying, hey, this is something that I believe in. Yes. Uh, and there's times that I backed out of that. They, I backed away and I've regretted it because I, then I see, and Diego will tell you, some of the other guys, then you see those ideas popping up somewhere else and you go, doggone it. I thought of that a year ago. Why didn't yes. I mean? Yes. So I think when you think of influence, own your idea, believe in it, and find a way to implement it. How many presentations have we <laughs> gone to where you yeah. look up on the screen and it's your yeah. own slide? Yeah, that you used five years ago, right? And you're yeah. like, "What is going on?" Yeah, I find myself sitting in the front row at the Boost conference when eight years ago I was standing in the back, not unsure of where to sit, who to connect yeah. with. The first time that I went to Boost, right? And so yeah. as we move up the ladder, um, what is one resource or tool that you can share with us, our site coordinators out there that you use right now that helps you either to stay organized or a book that you're reading or mm-hmm. something that moves you forward? What would that be? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, it's interesting because for me, I, I have to look for resources that, are, that help me grow in my areas where I need improvement. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, guy, you know, a person like me needs to be sometimes more practical. Because we can be very much about the idea and the vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, right? Uh, and The Checklist Manifesto takes your it, – it's it, the whole theme, the whole concept of that book is that we live in a very complicated world with complicated work. And our human brains, uh, we have lost the ability to be able to execute on the objectives of our work in a consistent fashion. So if we revert to concepts like developing checklists – that allow you to organize your work, you can better communicate that. Because sometimes I can, I don't know, maybe I can ramble a little bit. And so it's good to have a checklist approach to your work so that you can take an idea, condense it down to a series of steps that then line staff can sit there and go, oh, yeah, I can execute on that. Uh, So I I think our field needs a lot of that because 
in our work, we can be very broad and people are inspired, but not given a lot of direction. Yeah. So how do you do that? So I think uh, books like the Checklist Manifesto, I think, give you the conviction and then a tool to be able to say, all right, you know what? We can execute. This is how you do it. Yeah. You know, the one example I can think of from the the all-star days from yeah. way ago was yeah. the we were always thinking about marketing specifically to middle school young people, right? Yeah. When, when they vote with their feet. And it was this idea of guerrilla marketing. Mm. How do we create t-shirts mm. and yeah. give them to young people so that they feel compelled to come to the program. And now we have Terry who yeah. is essentially have, has created an empire in the t-shirt business yeah. and running the save after school campaign with yeah. his t-shirt idea, which originated from how do we get middle schools students in those seats. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just taking that idea to scale, but it started from a, from a very simple and humble idea. Yeah, yeah, and uh, absolutely. And it's interesting because, it, uh, you know, I put out a resource out there, it, you know, it's our national program guide. And in there, there are a couple of pages that take things like an incentive or a campaign project and you plug it into the larger student recruitment cycle and you sit there and you go, all right, here's a checklist format of how I do that mm -hmm. uh, so that your ideas and your inspiration stays organized because yeah. that is the knock on our work is that we have great ideas, we're motivated, we're motivators, but then we can be a little disorganized. So right. how do you organize your inspiration? That's like so, so how can we get a hold of that checklist? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely reference yeah. that book. Is there is there anything that you would be willing to? To share that we can we can put as a one page or two pager or yeah 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 no I, I yeah I've got it within a few feet of me right over there um, if you so, send it to me I can yeah. definitely link it for our folks out there great and I'll definitely, definitely put a, a a link also to that book that you mentioned um, yes and so Carlos I appreciate your time I I really mm -hmm. admire what you do and, and more importantly how you do it and so um, thank you for yeah, your you, time brother. today. Thank you, Bruno. I'm, I'm glad. I'm happy to be on the other side of that welcoming. You know that the that, W E L that you know, infamous. Well, uh, it's becoming infamous out there. I like how you have the pause when you end with pro and programs. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I've always it's, tripped on that. Why it, do you pause like that? I'm curious. Like, it's, what? it's, it's catchy. It, has to it, ca be catchy. it is catchy because I remember it. So there you go. Any last words for our folks out in the field out there in terms of being able to visualize yeah. that next level? Uh, yeah, you know, I always end my emails with uh, the term keep shining, you know, so to the field out there, to all the folks working hard for our kids, when you're down, when you're challenged, when you're facing obstacles, keep shining either way, you'll break through. Carlos, thank you so much for your time. Uh -huh. I'll be talking Take to you soon. Man. Take care. Right, thanks, man. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.